I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. In our Discord community, David, there were some people chatting about uh, the future of transportation in a post-collapse world. And it got us thinking about the state of transportation today, but more specifically, air travel and the obstacles to the continuation of air travel as we know it in the face of climate change, in the face of uh, environmental catastrophe. So that's what today's episode is going to be. We're going to talk a little bit about how climate change might impact service on airplanes. We might talk about the economic constraints to airfare going forward in the future, and maybe what we all can do about it. Uh, I forgot to research the future of air travel. I think some people were talking about Zeppelins, David. I, I, have, I have a little bit of Zeppelin knowledge. I have vast Zeppelin-based dreams, uh-huh. fueled by a childhood consumed reading 21 Balloons and uh, the journeys of an eccentric colonialist who tries to steal diamonds from the people of Krakatoa. Hold up, what? Uh, 21 Balloons, check it out. You know, get well-read, Daniel. Your literary embarrassment. But... <laughs> I'm not prepared to talk about the future of our jet fuel uh, air travel, what, what, or uh, not totally prepared. Well, you said you had a lot of dreams, David. What is your dream uh, future for air travel? My dream future is that I am the pilot of a Zeppelin, and I have like some of my coolest bros with me in this Zeppelin, and we're all like traveling the sky. Shout out. And, and, and we have like a, a sustainable farm on the roof of the Zeppelin. And uh, it's all solar powered, baby. We're like solar punk traveling across the sky. And we have fucking giant harpoons mounted on all the corners of this. And my Zeppelin is black as coal, except for this giant Jolly Roger painted on the sides. And I come up to other Zeppelins and I harpoon them and I reel them in and I make them either join my like Zeppelin armada or I, I cast them down into the sea below if I find them wanting. And if they're chill, they just don't want to be a, a Zeppelin air pirate. I like, I'll drive them somewhere and drop them off. But uh, the skies will be ruled by the people who truly want to be free. And the domain of land below, we will do our best to liberate them by dropping like pennies and stuff on people we don't like and, uh, and, and, and attacking from the sky. So you want to be an air pirate, David. Uh, you want to live in freedom. Uh, tell me, What's, gonna, what's the gas inside the uh, fuselage, or not the fuselage, but the, you know, the, the big, the flotation component of your airship? What's that gas? I know, I know you want me to say hydrogen, so it's easier for you to attack it with your rival pirate game. <laughs> but I actually, uh, part of my plan is to commit a daring raid on the U.S. strategic reserve of helium and uh, siphon it out enough to fill my, uh, my Zeppelin with uh, helium so I'm non-flammable. So uh, suck on that. Would it be fair then to say that uh, your future dream is going to be powered by uh, molecules of freedom, gaseous molecules of freedom, David? Because they're always trying to break free from these earthly bonds that tie us down to this rock that is filled with so much suffering and we can't just like fly around like birds. Did you actually know that helium seeps out of the atmosphere? Slowly, yeah. Once once we release, it's gone forever if it doesn't bind anything. Yeah, and I have helium in, in just random stuff. I'm not talking like balloons and stuff for birthday parties, but I've got hard drives that have helium in them. That's the new thing: helium powered hard drives. Well, all I know is two things. Number one, <clears throat> I'll be one of the first to join you in your uh, air pirate dream, and number two, uh, now that we've lost all of our uh, listeners, uh, maybe we should start the start the show start the actual show well let's let's uh, bring this back down to earth yeah let's come back down to earth david and one of the aircraft maybe we can start talking about is an aircraft that was actually grounded shortly after a number of problems that it had encountered caused a couple really tragic losses of life and that's the boeing 737 max 8 I was sort of hesitant to even bring this up in this show, Daniel, because so much has been said about the 737, the Max 8 line, the, as you said, tragic loss of life that's occurred of it. 
Um, it's been in the news. There's been lots of fear mongering about it. Um, the entire 737 line, people have been hesitant to fly those at all. And there's, there's, there's just so much stuff out there already. I don't know why we need somebody else jumping onto this thing, but there are a couple of things that I think are important in the greater context of these larger systemic issues that we talk about on this show that are really highlighted in the events leading up to these tragedies. And there are lots of, of different forces at play that are that are responsible. Ultimately, most of that responsibility does fall on Boeing and the decisions that were made in their ways to operate their business. David, I read up a little bit on this. So uh, let me just see if I can summarize. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But basically, you have Airbus and you have Boeing. There's intense competition between these two. They each want to increase their market share. And Boeing, in this case, had a new engine that it was very eager to get out as a product to get new customers, grow its market share. And one of the planes that it put this engine on was the 737. But unfortunately, the engine was too big. So they had to move it up and they had to move it forward. But in that process, it changed the way the plane flew. So they had to install a bunch of software on there to uh, accommodate for that so the pilots wouldn't think anything was different. But they did this so quickly, they didn't uh, properly train the pilots in their rush to get this new product out and squeeze some of that market share away from Airbus. And because people were not prepared to fly this plane, we had uh, a few tragic events where uh, these planes crashed. Yeah, that, that's more or less the gist of it. There's a couple points there I just want to clarify a little bit because I think they are important to this larger story. You are right. Uh, the new MAX 8 uh, creation of the 737 had a very radically different engine. It would shifted the entire flight profile of the aircraft. In a typical scenario, this would be considered almost an entirely new aircraft. It was that radically different than the traditional 737 that pilots had gotten used to that had been trained on. And normally, when you're doing something this dramatic, the various regulatory bodies of the world, the FAA, um, similar groups in other nations, require you to basically redesignate the aircraft as something new. So instead of say a 737, this might become a 738, a, a new type of aircraft. But that's problematic for Boeing and for these uh, airlines. The airline industry and the aircraft industry as a whole is very low margin. There's not a lot of money there to be made, and there's a lot of money to be lost. So anything that is high cost is immediately looked down on. And if you have a new aircraft that is a new designation, say 738 versus 737, then all those pilots you have who are already trained to fly 737s would have to be retrained at high cost mm -hmm. with lots of times and simulators, uh, hundreds of hours of, of training in order to be certified to fly this new aircraft, the 738. And this also takes time for the certification processes. It, it would dramatically delay how quickly they could get these aircraft shipped out and, and sent to these airlines. So Boeing pressured these regulatory bodies in order to get them to approve this as a type variant of the 737. So it's, it's a 737 MAX 8 and not a 738. But it did fly completely different, right? So how can they get away with not requiring the pilots to be retrained? Right. So this is where Boeing starts getting clever. And you alluded to this in this process. They devised this software that basically sits in between the pilot's controls and what the airplane is told to do. And it modifies the flight profile of the MAX 8 aircraft so that it flies like a traditional 737. And it does this by, by a lot of tricky math that says, okay, you know, on a 737 normal model, it's going to fly in this way. It's going to roll this way. It's going to pitch up. These are the, the, the aerodynamic flight profiles. And we know what they are on a 737 MAX 8. So we're just going to convert from one to the other. So as far as a pilot's concerned, when the system is enabled, as they pitch up, pitch down, increase the throttle, whatever, it's going to behave identically to a traditional 737, and their training should carry over exactly. This also controlled decisions in the way that they laid out the cockpit, making sure it stayed more or less the same compared to the older aircraft, instead of modifying it for things that made more sense for this modified device. Of course, when you start getting clever like this, like this is a great solution on paper. But it gets more complicated when that engineering actually hits the metal. And you have these cases where a computer bug in this software that's converting from one profile to the other can cause huge problems. The plane might not behave in a way that a pilot is typically used to. The pilot might not have, not have any experience with this type of bug or, or change in behavior because they've never been trained on a Max 8. They might have never flown a Max 8 in their entire life 
just were on the way to the airport to, to fly their next craft, learn on the way that, that oh, I'm flying a Max 8 today. I better brush up on what's different and read it out of a binder that they provided. Like, li- this literally is what happens oftentimes um, in the more negligent airlines. Because technically, you don't need to retrain a pilot for a Max 8. You just give them a binder. You let them know, hey, here's what's different. Here's the different processes. Here's what you need to know about MCAS, whatever. So it's, this is this is the airlines trying to save money. This is Boeing business division saying, well, if we can have a, a aircraft that they can just swap in, but has efficiency gains because of these new engines, then everybody wins. Everyone's going to have a cheaper craft. They don't have to retrain anything. We can get all the stuff out. And it's a very clever solution on paper from the business teams, uh, from the the engineering managers. But once again, in reality, you know, when these things come push to shove, this is not a safe way of conducting business. It's not a safe thing for these aircraft. And ultimately, it's not safe for the customers, which are the airlines, and ultimately the passengers, each and every one of us who decide to fly on these crafts. I guess decide to to fly isn't necessarily the right thing, because oftentimes when we buy a ticket, we have no idea what aircraft we're getting on to. We just say, oh, this is the cheapest fare. Let's let's buy this. So it's interesting that you mentioned, like from a business perspective, this might have been a good decision on paper. And and it might have even worked out uh, if they had implemented it better. But like you're mentioning, what's sometimes what's best for business in the short term comes at the expense of safety for customers or some kind of broader conception of sustainability in the long run. And this is kind of what happened, right? Boeing took that bet that the benefits they could get from implementing this quickly would translate into short-term market share gains and profit that would go above and beyond whatever costs they would incur later down the line from uh, the repercussions of something that wasn't safe. And maybe their uh, uh, finance team is still trying to uh, tally the numbers on that. Who knows how it'll come out in the end. But, but really, David, the airline industry has gone through massive deregulation over the past several decades. It was in 1978 that Jimmy Carter signed a famous law passed by Congress that uh, really reshaped the airline industry in massive ways. You know, It's something I don't think a lot of people realize, and maybe this is something we take for granted today. But in the early days of aviation, air travel was not really considered in business terms. It was not a business so much as it was a public good, right? It was the infrastructure we used to traverse the skies much in the same way that roads are the infrastructure we use to traverse land. And at the time before 1978, airlines didn't even set their own ticket prices and they could not even determine their own routes. These were determined by something Uh, called the Civil Aeronautics Board, a government entity, at least here in the United States. And that was all done away with when that law was signed in 1978. And the effects, David, were massive. You had immediately airlines having the ability to compete with each other on things like ticket prices. They could set up new routes. This is what led to the hub-and-spoke method of air travel, where instead of going point to point, the consolidation of the market allowed airlines to invest in massive airports that they could use as hubs, bringing all their customers to this central location, and then using smaller planes to go point to point. And this is really praised from a lot of people leaning towards the free market ideologies as a watershed moment that really cracked open the airline industry and allowed the broader public to access it. You mentioned the hub and spoke system, Daniel, and, and you didn't really go into details of that so much or what alternative systems we might see. Um, and, and I want to really talk about that in a moment because there's a lot of uh, interesting conversations there from both an economic as well as an environmental standpoint, uh, which is going to be the, the latter half of the show where we start really getting into the reason why we're talking about this on a show that's related to collapse. You know, what does air travel have to do with anything? And, and believe me, we'll get to that. It's not just the uh, faulty aircraft falling out of the sky. But before we get to all that, uh, this deregulation stuff is really interesting because, uh, yes, the airline industry did deregulate, but it's often cited as one of these big successes of deregulation because you saw many more people able to fly than ever before, as well as the fact that uh, flights have stayed, for the most part, very safe. Um, and, and this is championed as like, yeah, you know, this is a great balance of regulation in terms of uh, governments coming in and making sure that passenger safety is first and foremost, but also allowing uh, these these companies to try and maximize their profit within the limits of still watching out for, you know, like we mentioned, these passengers. Though I guess that 737 story at the beginning of this episode sort of flies in direct contrast to that. But 
I feel like you're bringing up this deregulation stuff because you have some larger point that you really want to make, or at least I hope so. I never have a larger point I'm trying to make, David. I just like stating, stating the facts, you know? But I guess, I guess the larger point I'm trying to make is you're absolutely right that this is still seen to this day as a massive success story. And I want to just talk briefly about why that is. So I found an article by Fred Smith and Braden Cox of the Library of Economics and Liberty. Sounds very prestigious <laughs> and not at all ideological. Of course it's prestigious, David. Liberty is the engine of our great society, right? Liberty is the engine of liberation. Have you considered that? You can't spell liberation without liberty. And liberation is the twin engine of positive change. Optimism. All right, let's, <laughs> let's come back down to, uh, to earth here. So they write in this article about how regulation was really good for everybody, like you mentioned. Because before, airlines could only compete on service, right? That's why you had things like grand pianos in planes and stewardesses and flight attendants serving caviar. But it was extremely expensive. So only a limited number of people flew. But once airlines could compete on pricing and routes, the number of passengers between 1978 and the early 2000s more than doubled. And so this was a massive uh, increase in access. But I mean, here's something they write about the ability for airlines to lower cost in terms of labor. Quote, the regulated airline monopolies received returns on capital that were supposed to be reasonable, comparable to what a company might expect to receive in a competitive market. But these returns factored in high costs that often would not exist in a competitive market. For example, the airline's unionized workforce gained generous salaries and inefficient work rules compared with what would be expected in a competitive market, end quote. And I think it's important to hone in on what they said about how under regulation, a company has to endure costs that they would not endure in a competitive market. And the fact that pricing went down and travelers went up meant that this was a great thing for the industry. But I just want to point out that when you notice these arguments about why the free market is so good, they tend to hone in on these like very limited variables that are always economic in nature, right? Like this emphasis on price. They're saying, yes, this, this was great for us because prices went down. And it's making the assumption that regulation is bad because everyone wants low prices. But what this ignores is the fact that regulation is never in the business, so to speak, of making companies more money. It's never in the business of making business itself more efficient, especially if we're talking about in an environmental context. The purpose of regulation is to add costs that businesses are otherwise ignoring. If you want to regulate a lumber company by restricting the number of trees it can cut down, of course that will raise the prices. And of course that will limit the access to lumber from customers because that's the whole point. The whole point is to preserve our natural uh, woodlands. And so I don't really want to argue here whether or not regulation was good or bad for business. The point I want to bring here is that those business considerations should be secondary to our priorities for an inhabitable world, among many other things. And uh, so we brought up the hub and spoke model of air travel, right? And this is something that occurred because airlines could consolidate. They could invest large amounts of capital into regional airports that could serve a tremendous flow of people. But with those economies of scale came a dependence. And that dependence was on that flow of travelers itself. When you build something to scale like that, the fixed costs go up so much that the only way to maintain it is to ensure that the flow of goods, the flow of customers, the flow of capital coming in and out of that system never stops. And in fact, often has to accelerate to keep up with investor demand and growth on capital, right? And this is a point that we made from episode 11, Designing Deception, about how factories that were built for wartime production required the reorienting of our entire economies because those factories had to keep running. And after the war stopped, they had nothing to produce for, so we had to reorient the economy to a consumption-based one so that they could keep running, right? And so I guess what I'm trying to say, David, uh, in a long, roundabout, rambly type of way here is that mm. for better or worse, this deregulation created a system that is dependent on high flows of traffic. And without that high flows of traffic, 
it's very possible that the airline industry could collapse. And that's problematic, David, if, as we discuss on this episode and as we discuss on this show broadly, systems like air travel are unsustainable. If the very systems that we're building to large scale end up destroying the environment upon which they ultimately depend, then it becomes impossible to simply scale back, right? Because once you build out these large systems that require these massive flows constantly, you can't necessarily just scale that back without really resulting in the collapse of the economic structure. And that just may be the position we find airlines in today. You brushed up on a lot of points there, Daniel, that I think are going to be more salient by the end of this episode when we address the individual components, namely the economies of scale, uh, why they depend upon that, why we as the people of Earth can't uh, survive with that continuing on the way it is now. Um, and, and as we address these environmental concerns, as well as the economic things, uh, talk a bit more about the economic nature of the industry as a whole, uh, this will all make more sense in, in terms of what you just said. But I, I just want to summarize a couple things here and, and really drive home the fact that the, this is a really low margin industry. Yeah, please clean up my rambling, David. I'm, I'm going to do it by just different rambling. Um, <laughs> this is a really incredibly low profit industry. Um, margins are very thin. Uh, they have improved as uh, people got used to paying higher prices for tickets. When jet fuel prices were high, oil went back down. They didn't adjust the tickets so much. They're learning new ways all the time to nickel and dime us. New digital technologies enable them to price tickets in ways that uh, we actually alluded to in one of these earlier episodes. I can't remember which one now, Daniel, but, but talking about the digital surveillance that allows marketers to figure out exactly how much you're willing to pay for stuff. Well, airlines are really one of the big innovators in this industry, and they know so much about you, and they know where you're going, when you need to get there, and they are all sort of kind of, but not really in terms of legal slippery loopholes, all working together with these these uh, combined ticketing uh, companies and technologies to make sure that you are paying the most that you are willing to pay, thereby maximizing their own profit. And then, of course, this is where I would make my joke about airline food, except there isn't any anymore. So I can't even do that. But uh, they nickel and dime us in every single way possible. Oftentimes now I'm seeing things like carry-on luggage is even being charged beyond the, with the one free bag that you're allowed uh, legally, at least here in the United States. You're charged for everything. If you want to like board earlier, you're charged for that. If you want like to pick your seat, you're charged for that. These ultra low cost carriers are really shaking up the industry by being able to pull these profit margins that these uh, larger traditional airlines like Delta can't. And then... Um, put pricing pressure on those airlines so they have to respond to their own strategies. Um, but, but, but part of this is also pushed by this shifting uh, strategy in the way that these airlines are running their own economies of scale. And you talked about the hub and spoke system, which is really important for these large major airlines, airlines like Delta, where you have these hubs, and these hub cities tend to be major airports, uh, Atlanta Hartsfield, JFK, LAX, you know, these large airports that have international service that have enough gates to allow these large airlines to run hundreds of flights out of them a day. And this is a very efficient way of doing things, or it has been since they converted to this system once they were able to pick their own flights and, uh, and paths after that deregulation bill. But the alternative system to this, which we alluded to earlier, is a point-to-point -point based system where instead of flying, you know, from Atlanta to uh, Chicago and then to South Bend, now I can just fly direct from South Bend to wherever I need to go. And the ultra low cost carriers, this is companies like Alaskan Airlines, like Spirit Airlines, they figured out ways to maximize their profit. And one of these major ways is this shift to a point to point model. They have smaller aircraft, which have gotten far more efficient because of innovations like the MCAS technology that ultimately doomed this Max 8, but also made it a much more efficient aircraft that they were able to operate at even lower prices than they would have normally before. And what's also important about this is the range of these new aircraft is much larger than the aircraft that are available in the 70s and 80s. Uh, they're smaller, but they can still travel internationally if they're pressed to. So it really is shaking up the airline industry. Airbus bet big on the hub and spoke with their A380, that giant double-decker, massive craft that could only fly into a couple airports worldwide while Boeing shifted their perspective more to this point-to-point -point system. Um, and, and we're really seeing a battle of these technologies right now. Consumers at the current time are winning, if you're talking about just their wallets, because there's more flights available than ever before. There's more direct flights available than ever before, because uh, we really love not having to have layovers. Um, but environmentally, the question remains, you know, 
are we winning at all in any of this? And and obviously, as listeners of this show and hearing us having rambled on about airlines, uh, even before this episode, you know the answer to that is absolutely no. But technically, a point-to-point based system is more efficient from an environmental perspective because you have flights that are flying direct from one place to another instead of this extra flight in between. You know, it's the hypotenuse of a triangle instead of the two sides. So there's less total flight time. Uh, which is good for fuel, uh, which means it's good for CO2 emissions, which is, means it's good for CO2 effective emissions when we factor in radiative forcing, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this also means that we're more likely to fly in the first place mm-hmm. in order to sustain these large economies of scale necessary to make both of these models work. And yeah. that is where we run into this, this Jevons paradox thing. Are you familiar with Jevons paradox, Daniel? J- uh, the great Jevon um had a paradox he said uh you know do i fly in my plane or do i fly my uh pirate zeppelin and he couldn't decide which and that's where the name comes from there would be no paradox the obvious choice is the pirate zeppelin <laughs> but um but he was late for a meeting you see so he was late for a meeting oh no he should have should have telecommuted that see that was the paradox is he really needed to get somewhere but he wanted to be in his pirate zeppelin so he he ended up not traveling at all which is the greatest uh paradox of anyway no Jevons paradox is to very quickly summarize is basically the idea that as we increase efficiency and we're consuming less of a resource, oftentimes that means we increase the demand for this product, whatever it is, in this case, airline flights, and end up consuming more of the product that we were saving than before. So to put this exactly in terms of airline flights, if we make fuel use more efficient on these airplanes, so we can you know, consume, say, 30% less fuel than we were before, then that's going to enable us to charge less for these tickets because we don't have this fixed cost. We can reduce it. That's going to increase demand. And then as we increase demand, more people are going to want to fly. And ultimately, that means we're going to be supplying more flights. And we end up using more of this original resource, jet fuel, than we were before the efficiency saving. And this has really been an idea that has defined uh, not just the airline industry, but really a lot of these energy use uh, areas, but but we really see it spectacularly in the airline world. As flights become more accessible, more people fly, we consume more resources. So even though we have more efficient aircraft all the time, we're actually burning more fuel and polluting more CO2 than at any time before. And I, I, real, I realize at this point, Daniel, I'm very far off from your rant, but I, I feel like this is the direction I want to take the show. So, Well, hold on. We have to pause because, all right, Jevons Paradox, I'd never heard of that before, but this is a concept that I actually did want to talk about so we can transition to climate change. But real quick, before we do that, I just want to point out a little tidbit of history here. So prior to this 1978 uh, Deregulation Act, there was actually quite a number of airlines who were against it. And one of those, believe it or not, was Delta. So Delta put out a newspaper ad called Airline Deregulation, and deregulation is in quotation marks, and it says, wolf in sheep's clothing. Part of it reads, quote, the issue is, will our nation's system of commercial aviation survive as a vital private sector industry serving the public interests? Believe it or not, that survival could very well be in doubt. To be certain, the patient, the airline industry, is anything but ill. Nonetheless, it is being dealt a dose of airline deregulation medicine by its, and this is in quotation marks as well, friendly deregulation doctors. Friends like that, the airlines don't need because the medicine might just kill the patient. <laughs> um, and they go on to say in this pamphlet or ad that, you know, if this deregulation occurs, would, quote, very well result in concentrating the airline industry in the hands of only a few carriers and of causing service deterioration at smaller cities and in smaller markets and of jeopardizing the financing of airport developments, among other problems, end quote. And I just thought that was funny because today we think of Delta as being a major airline, right? It's one of the ones that got concentrated and operates a few hubs of its own. But I suppose at the time, they were probably staring down the barrel of this impending cutthroat competition and wondering if they were going to be one of the airlines to get swallowed up by a different one. And it reminds me of the way that so many of our large companies operate today, right? That is, 
They love to talk about the merits of the free market, at least in terms of their ability to exploit labor anywhere and for any wage. But besides that, they'll lobby just as quick as anybody for regulations that make it harder or impossible for new market entrants to compete with them. A couple of weeks ago, David, in episode 76, Self Made, you were talking about John Deere, the tractor company, and how they encourage government to protect their monopolies by preventing their own customers, right? Never mind whole companies, from repairing the tractors they've already bought. And Apple has been doing the same thing. They've recently pressured Congress to protect their ability to void warranties for anyone that attempts to repair the cell phone that they've paid for with their own money. And this seems to be the strategy, right? Gobble up market share as quickly as possible. And then once you're on top, use your money and influence to write the laws that then secure your power well into the future. Uh, so, but it's just funny looking at this ad from Delta back in the day, you know, uh, saying, oh, deregulation is bad. You know, it's going to cause consolidation of the market, which by the way, is exactly what happened. They're kind of right in that respect. And this economies of scale form of airline traffic that we have today actually did result in more congestion, fewer service in some of these smaller markets. So maybe they were onto something, but uh, I guess they were one of the winners. So, uh, But back to, uh, back to Jevin's paradox, David. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like we're, we're ping-ponging around all over the place here, Daniel. We're, one second, we're deregulation, and then we're at like, I'm rambling about uh, <laughs> models of airline systems, and Jevin's paradox, then we're back to deregulation. So There's, there's no cohesion to this. I'm, I'd be surprised if anyone is still with us. No, there's a lot of turbulence so far in this episode. So I'm going to stop right here and redirect us and focus us on what the people actually care about or what I actually care about. And that is the climate aspect of airline travel. And we've alluded to this a couple of times throughout this episode, but climate change and being able to fly halfway around the world at a whim is inextricably linked. Obviously, we're burning huge amounts of jet fuel to fly in these giant metal tubes across the world, and uh, that has an effect on the environment. There's a lot of people who are flying all the time. Uh, at, at any point, if you look up at the sky, there are roughly 10,000 planes in the air at any one time, any second. And those 10,000 planes are carrying almost 1.3 million people. That's like a whole city's worth of people constantly in the air, 24 hours a day. So uh, obviously during peak times, it's higher. There are some times when it's lower, but the idea that there's so much of our species in the air is unimaginable compared to even just a few decades ago. So I'm, uh, flying is incredible. If you just look at the perspective of the fact that you can get in this airplane, look down upon the earth, uh, and, and the views that you see as you look down upon this earth should really be a sobering thing that, that, you know, the same way that we look down at the earth from space for the first time and we realize, hey, look at this. It's all just like one place. There's n nothing separating us that doesn't need to be. Airplanes should be that same effect, but for some reason they're not. And and we've instead made it the worst possible experience where you like show up at the airport, then you're like digitally surveilled, your face is added to like a database. Uh, somebody like probes you and like scans your hands for explosives. You take off your shoes, take off your belts, put all your electronics in like 20 different boxes after waiting in line for like an hour. This is the worst possible experience of the most magical thing that we can have. Mm. Unfortunately, this magical thing is killing the earth. And uh, once again, I'm, I'm all over the place. So <laughs> let's go back to that. Climate change, Daniel. Let's talk about climate change. It's kind of a catch-22, right, for the airline industry. They globally, a 1999 IPCC estimate put their contribution of greenhouse gas emissions at around 2%. Uh, that's now at least 2.5% and growing. If you look at just the figure for the United States, the EPA uh, estimates that the airline industry is responsible for 9% of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you mentioned radiative forcing, and that possibly doubles the effect of that greenhouse gas uh, contribution because the, the fuel that the airplanes burn while they're in the air actually contributes to um, cloud formation. Yeah, well, let me just quickly <laughs> sum up radiative forcing because you sound a little uh, lost without a GPS right there. Uh, radiative forcing... so. Well, obviously, we're burning fuel all the time. You know, you get in your car, you're burning fuel. If you get in an airplane, you're burning fuel. But where you burn that fuel turns out makes a difference. Right. And it's better to burn it down here on the surface of the earth than it is up in the sky. And that's because of this thing Daniel's talking about called radiative forcing. Although cargo ships actually make their own 
contrails, so to speak. Yeah, we did talk about uh, marine sea clouds, which are going to disappear in this great success for air pollution by 2022, but is actually going to warm up the Earth 0.2 to 0.5 degrees Celsius because of the lack of these marine uh, sea clouds. And nobody has realized this is happening in the IPCC reports or the people who uh, push through this sulfur uh, bill. Wait, David. GPS, come on. What's radiative forcing? Okay, yeah, radiative forcing. Sorry. Uh, where you burn the fuel matters. Our flight path is all over the place. I know. And so if, if you're flying up at altitude, burning this fuel, you're depositing that carbon dioxide directly into this upper atmosphere. And there it's going to be doing the most effect in capturing the heat that's coming into the earth and then you magnify this effect with the contrails and the uh the various uh, aerosol effects of this this stuff coming out so when you're creating these clouds these contrails um sometimes they can have cooling effects sometimes they can have warming effects it's actually very complicated and uh, disputed on which one is doing more uh more warming or war- more cooling from these clouds and you find different sources that suggest different things but what isn't in doubt is the fact that pumping this carbon dioxide directly into this place increases the the warming effect of this carbon dioxide uh, because you know none is getting caught in the ocean and none is getting wrapped up and sequestered in trees nearby and stuff like that it's just direct straight in so the effect is that the carbon dioxide emitted at altitude here up in the troposphere is depending on the paper you're reading 1.9 to 4.7 times more effective more more potent than than typical and uh, the IPCC has nailed down that, that number to somewhere in the twos. So about double. So that means if you're doing one of those carbon footprint calculators to figure out how much carbon dioxide you emitted from your trip from Atlanta to New York, most of them don't take into account radiative forcing. Some of them do. Um, they use different numbers for it, depending on if they're trying to upsell you or undersell you. Um, but it's probably double what it says. So if I think that I'm just emitting a half ton of carbon dioxide, which again is a massive amount of carbon dioxide for one person to emit in what is basically a couple of hours when many people who aren't Americans emit not much more than that in an entire year. But that means my effective warming capability that I'm contributing to the global atmosphere is actually one ton of CO2, not just half. Which is why, yeah, sure, airline travel is only 10% of the United States carbon dioxide emissions. Mm -hmm. But the effective warming of that is double. So that would make it 20%. That's a significant source of warming and CO2 equivalents that we see in, in terms of these larger climate change things. And we can't just ignore airline travel anymore. We can't pretend that this is a convenience that we can keep if we want to get to net zero by 2050. There's no plan for how to reach that while maintaining air travel as it is, without technology that magically pulls this carbon dioxide and sequesters it affordably without affecting airline tickets. That doesn't exist. There is no plan for this. Right. We'll talk about carbon credits and stuff in a little bit. I'm also interested in how climate change is going to impact uh, airlines themselves. They are, on the one hand, contributing to it. And, but th- and this is what I meant by Catch-22. Because the very act of flying the plane contributes to climate change in a significant way, yet it also harms the ability for airlines to continue that service in ways that they have in the past. For instance, we had that episode on heat. And so temperatures themselves have a major impact on an airplane's ability to simply get off the ground. Uh, The summer of 2017, for example, was frustrating for a number of United States air passengers. A representative from American Airlines said the extraordinary heat was a wake-up call. They had to cancel flights in Phoenix, Arizona when air temperatures got so high, the flight manuals that pilots were reading actually uh, just assumed that they would never encounter temperatures over 118 degrees, so they didn't know what to do, uh, so they canceled those flights. And then another thing that comes along with heat is unpredictable thunderstorms, and this is actually pretty interesting because when you think about the things that impede an airplane's ability to fly, uh, I think of things like tornadoes, hurricanes, right? But actually, thunderstorms are pretty hazardous for flights. So in April of 2017, down here in Atlanta, David, Delta had to cancel 3,000 flights during the very busy spring break season. And this is going to be problematic going forward because thunderstorms typically are not predictable in the same way that hurricanes and blizzards are, right? Uh, They can come and go in a heartbeat in just an hour's notice. 
And with the more predictable blizzards, for example, airlines can plan in advance and figure out、uh, logistical ways to reroute flights or maybe redirect their passengers. But when it's unpredictable like that, it can cause massive delays, massive congestions,、uh, like those 3,000 flights that were canceled. Let's see, another thing that's going to impact airports, David, are rising seas. We've talked about that a couple of times. Yeah. 20. Of Norway's 45 airports are exposed to sea level rise. Yeah, that's nothing. Dan, I'm here in New York where we have three airports that are all going to be underwater <laughs> within a, a few decades.、Uh, there is no, no optimistic plan about this or what to do with it.、Uh, I, no, David, America would not allow this to happen. No, well, New York City is, is America. We have talked about like building massive seawalls and stuff, but it only really takes one storm to come in and, and sandy level thing, flood these, these airports, ruin the, the substructure beneath the runway, and then you make it so that these massive multi billion dollar investments that we're currently investing in, we're putting billions of dollars into LaGuardia right now. Will be nothing but just like beautiful giant parking lots at some point because、uh, it's not going to fly. If、uh, you'll give me that pun right there, <laughs> I think we've already given too many puns away this episode. But <laughs> yeah, you, you say New York has a challenge, David, but、uh, Hong Kong actually has seen the coming rising seas and they have responded. They are underway right now on construction on a third runway and it's only costing them $18 billion, right? Oh, nice.、Um, it will include a, a new seawall that rises 21 feet above the ocean. So. Um, that should last them for a little bit. But I guess one of the challenges here is that airports are kind of built where they're built on purpose. It's not easy to expand them, right? They're usually surrounded by very expensive real estate.、Uh, runways are extremely long. They're very big, they take up a lot of land. And they have to get longer as the temperature rises. That's right, because of that lift problem. As air temperature increases, the air becomes less dense. So there's less lift for the wing. So you either have to lighten the load of the aircraft or they need a longer runway to pick up speed. And this is problematic, especially like if you're in New York City, you don't have any land to build. And what's interesting is that these changes in our global climate as a result of climate change are very unpredictable. And some subtle changes can have massive impacts. For example, in Europe, One of the things that threatens airports going into the future is the changing wind patterns. Europe is going to be impacted in a major way by the changing jet stream. And many of their runways were oriented based on historical, very predictable wind patterns, directions, and speeds. And as winds change, it can cause crosswinds for some of their airports, which make it difficult for certain planes to land, right? So you have this confluence of change that will be impacting. Air travel at the same time that demand is rising rapidly. Well, you know, Daniel, going through all this stuff and just thinking about airlines and air travel as a whole, so much of it depends upon consistency, being able to predict exactly all these things to manage these extremely complicated schedules and patterns and systems and infrastructure pieces all around the world. And it's the only way that we can keep this whole system flying flawlessly. Without falling apart at the seams. And I mean, how often, just like, a, like you mentioned, a little storm will come through and it causes cascading effects around the world that might take days to fix. Or similarly, if, if there's a technical glitch, a computer shuts down, somebody gets hacked with ransomware, whatever it is,、uh, these things can spiral and, and spin out of control very rapidly and throw the entire world's air travel out of control. And, and typically, this just means, you know, a few canceled flights,、uh, some people are gonna be met with delays. But as these things get worse and, and larger, Then who knows how this could cascade in, into not just、uh, inconveniences for customers, but also larger systems affecting global trade and stuff. And this is important because we, as, as we mentioned several times on the show before, live in this, I don't know, let's call it an island of stability in terms of the larger climate of the, of the earth,、mm -hmm. where we've had this very fortunate place that civilization has evolved under these, these very narrow, very consistent, stable climate systems. And we've been able to predict and depend upon the fact that we can predict more or less what's going to happen. The monsoon season always comes. You know, temperatures are going to get hot and cold over the course of the year, but within a very narrow range. But as time goes on and we put more and more energy into this global weather system, we're finding that these extremes are more extreme. And we're finding not only that they're more extreme, but they're happening more frequently. And 
this this throws all sorts of systems into chaos, not just things that depend immediately on weather like air travel, but also like we're seeing right now going on in the Midwest of the country that threw off the the corn planting for a couple of weeks. And though the, we are now approaching the full planting amount that we're supposed to have for this time, these things went in late and uh, the ultimate harvest is going to be affected by that. And, and very quickly, we see how these systems, which are so intimately connected with each other, can start cascading out of control. And just going back to that hub and spoke conception of air travel, that relationship is amplified when we concentrate these systems across the board. When all of our agriculture, when like a major percent of our food comes from one region where we have consolidated the entire agriculture into a a particular industrial model, when there are disruptions there, that reverberates in so many places, which would not necessarily occur if these systems were playing out in a decentralized kind of local level. And actually, David, there's a paper in Nature that came out in 2015 that I want to just touch on a bit here because they kind of address this. They, they address the fact that the impact of climate change is nonlinear, right? These shocks that we experience from these changing patterns of our environment have massive, massive repercussions for economies and local people all over the world. But when they looked at the stated economic output of the globe as a whole, we don't really see this nonlinear relationship. So what's going on here? Um, So they kind of dug into this to try and figure out why this discrepancy exists. And what they find is that while it is still impossible to fully grasp the implications of climate change on our economy and ways of life, All of our estimates up to this point are most likely way too low in terms of the effect that climate change will have on the global economy. Oh, and I guess I should name the paper. It is, uh, the article name is Global Nonlinear Effect of Temperature on Economic Production, published in Nature 2015 by Marshall Burke and others. Quote, if future adaptation mimics past adaptation, Unmitigated warming is expected to reshape the global economy by reducing average global incomes roughly 23% by 2100 and widening global income inequality relative to scenarios without climate change. In contrast to prior estimates, expected global median losses are many times larger than leading models indicate. End quote. And this study was done looking at historical data of 166 countries between 1960 and 2010. And so, again, they try to highlight the discrepancy between what we see in localized areas in terms of the, the catastrophe that is climate change versus what we see in the aggregate data. Here's an example from the paper, quote, numerous basic productive components of an economy display a highly non-linear relationship with daily or hourly temperature. For example, labor supply, labor productivity, and crop yields all decline abruptly beyond temperature thresholds located between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius. However, it is unclear how these abrupt declines at the micro level are reflected in coarser macro level data. End quote. And while they offer some possible explanations for why this discrepancy may exist, perhaps while there are localized shocks, perhaps the overall economy elsewhere is doing fine. And so it kind of just washes out uh, the bad things that happen to some people. While that might be true, I think uh, we have to keep in mind, again, David, this is something we talk a lot about, is that data itself is not neutral. We have all these economic indices around our world that try to tell us how the economy is doing. But where that data comes from and what gets left out is decided by humans who are biased and who might be focusing on the economics at the expense of what's occurring in our natural world. Again, from the paper, quote, strong responses of output to temperature observed in micro data from wealthy countries are not apparent in existing macro studies. If wealthy populations actually are unaffected by temperature, this could indicate that wealth and human-made capital are substitutes for natural capital in economic activity. Resolving this apparent discrepancy thus has central implications for understanding the nature of sustainable development. End quote. And I understand that's kind of a mouthful, and this whole paper is, but that's an interesting thought they just said, David, that we might be substituting money for quote unquote natural capital, right? And when they say natural capital, they just mean 
you know, we're replacing the idea of breathable air with the money that we accumulate. We're accounting for the money and not really accounting for the fact that we're giving up the natural environment to get that. And we've talked about this before, the idea that gross domestic product or GDP, which is the way our governments measure total economic output, is a terrible, it's a short-sighted and fallacious tool for measuring value. When you consider what it is or, or what it is not, it's not hard to see how our economic indices can totally continue to show growth and profit while at the same time the world is collapsing. Right? We here in the United States, we represent financial uh, trading in our gross domestic product. And so imagine I'm a company here in Atlanta or you're up in New York, and let's say you make money by trading lumber. So you're profiting off of the destruction of some rainforest in South America. You're making a bunch of money. This is revealed in the data of our economic productivity. Uh, but oh no, that rainforest that you were making profit off of is depleted and the local communities collapse and people are starving and the biodiversity is destroyed and, and those cities uh, around there are, are devastated. That's not reflected because at the end of the day, you just buy lumber somewhere else. Instead of one Latin American country, it's another Latin American country. And we will continue to show that our economy is improving. And that data will be reflected even in global indices because at the local level of that Latin American country, perhaps the well-being of those people are not accounted for in our financial profits and wealth accumulation. So that's just an example of how we can continue to show economic growth while at the same time our environment is being destroyed. Uh, and so again, back to this paper, what the researchers then did is they ran a more robust analysis on economic productivity in those countries. Uh, and they tried to control for economic shocks that might be common to all of these countries. They try to account for country-specific anomalies like political policies to try and get at the heart of economic productivity. And they found that as temperatures rise, there is a maximum threshold after which economic productivity starts falling off a cliff in a very nonlinear fashion. And it's very interesting what they write. Quote, we do not find that technological advances or the accumulation of wealth and experience since 1960 has fundamentally altered the relationship between productivity and temperature. Results using data from 1960 to 1989 and between 1990 and 2010 are nearly identical. We find only weak suggestive evidence that richer populations are less vulnerable to warming and no evidence that experience with high temperatures or technological advances since 1960 have altered the global response to temperature. This suggests that adaptation to climate change may be more difficult than previously believed, and that the accumulation of wealth, technology, and experience might not substantially mitigate global economic losses during this century. End quote. Uh, so, so basically what they're writing, David, is that our ability to adapt to climate change has not changed at all. No technology that we have developed, no experience with, with how climate change impacts our economy, none of that has made us more resilient to it. And now I want to play uh, a very short audio clip from a guy, a, a man named Rod Badcock, speaking on the TEDx stage in New Zealand in 2017. Air transport is a special scrutiny. It's currently, its emissions have grown by 75% since 1990. That's double the rest of the economy. The demand for air transport keeps growing and it grows inexorably on an exponential rate. In fact, the world economy, and in particular, the New Zealand economy, relies on this growth. In New Zealand, we have $12 billion of international tourism, 99% of which comes in by air. So to deliver that climate agreement that we've made, while still maintaining that growth and maintaining the economy, we must achieve a 30% improvement in, in the fuel efficiency of our aircraft. Business as usual is not an option. We're unlikely to gain that fuel efficiency from a jet engine. 
we need a new technology. <laughs> wow. What do you think about that, David? Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to imagine how sad and like trapped in the status quo you have to be to say all that first stuff where like we are facing catastrophe basically we have no choice we need to act and that action is a 30 percent increase in fuel efficiency right what a fucking lame ass conclusion about all this stuff well i love how he says um business as usual is not an option and then he goes on to say uh yeah so basically to maintain the business as usual growth of our economies uh, that we depend on, uh, we need to improve fuel efficiency of aircraft. <laughs> that is the very definition of business as usual. You know, w- when I hear things like this, sometimes, David, I feel like uh, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills over here, right? Like this is a crazy world we live in, and sometimes I'm like, when will the practical joke just end? When I was a child, I really thought that all the adults in, in the world, all the scientists, were like the smartest people, and like. They had all the answers and I was going to grow up one day and discover that, you know, someone had the keys and and solutions to all of the world's problems. And then you listen to something like that and you're like, well, shit, I guess, I guess we don't have the answers and we're not even really trying. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I think that's a really sad, but, but good way to put it. And uh, I mean, it's 2019 though, Daniel, everybody knows that all the answers come from random white guys with podcasts. No, you shouldn't listen to anything we say. But <laughs> well, to be honest, though, we're not really. I mean, we do offer like, we, what can we do? We don't know. We don't have any answers. <laughs> we don't have. <laughs> don't listen to us. This is not a solution. This is. Uh, this is. There's no solutions here. A wake up call. Um, wait. I want. I want to jump in here though, Daniel, and uh, talk a little bit about business as usual and the way that it stands with the airline industry. All right. And why it's just not going to happen. We discussed earlier that uh, airlines are a significant source of carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, We are running out of time to hit that net zero point that the IPCC requires us to hit in order to stay, you know, under two degrees Celsius. So that leaves us a couple decades to get to net zero. That means zero emissions as a human civilization. And of course, they don't think that's possible. Uh, So instead, we're going to have uh, carbon capture and sequestration technology, uh, which doesn't exist and uh, which, if it does exist, is going to be fairly expensive. Um, They're trying to get to a couple hundred dollars per ton. Realistically, the IPCC predicts in the 500 to a couple thousand range. And well, wait a second. Let's go back to that that flight from New York to uh, Atlanta, which isn't even a a tremendously long flight. The round trip for that, if I'm flying economy, because obviously as you move up to larger seats, you're basically taking a larger share of the total fuel emissions. So business and first class consume more for the same flight. But if I'm flying economy, that, that's 0.5 roughly tons round trip, radiative forcing that's now one tons per round trip. And if, if I'm on a good flight for New York to Atlanta, it's $150 if I get a really good deal. Typically, more realistically, I'm going to be paying 250 maybe 300 if it's a busier season. But if I add in that carbon cost, now flying costs 500 to $600 for the same flight. And flying is already a luxury. There's only about 40% of Americans who are some of the wealthiest people in the world who are going to fly annually. And the people who fly at all in their entire lives is not much bigger than that number. So flying is already a luxury for people who can afford it. And if we ratchet this up even more, then there's going to be very few people who can afford to fly at all. You're basically doubling the cost of most tickets. That's that much less flights. This is going to strangle the airline industry. And the airline industry depends on this mass volume that we see in order to survive. And to be fair, most of the profits that the airline industry make come from businesses. I think you have some stats on this, Daniel. Right. I think 75% of the profits that airlines enjoy come from their business clients. But in terms of the actual number of customers, I think business travelers represent only like 15% or so of total travelers. And a lot of this is because of most of these tickets that these businesses are purchasing come so frequently as a last minute thing. Oh, we need to fly out, you know, these dates. We didn't know what time the meeting was going to be until a week or two out. So we're purchasing a last minute ticket, which is more expensive correspondingly. Or maybe we're flying business class or maybe we're flying first class. And, and those are more profitable for the airlines. 
And so even though most of the people on these flights aren't at least on paper there for business, though oftentimes uh, this is a harder metric for these airlines to catch, especially because now so many people will buy things with their own credit card and ultimately be reimbursed by their company for it. So that this, this actual metric is a little bit difficult to nail down. But business is really subsidizing most of our personal flights. But what happens when the cost for these businesses to make these flights basically doubles? There's going to be less flights going on in the first place. Further, as companies try and look green and people are better educated about the effects that flying has negatively on the environment, they're going to be less likely to travel so much. Further, as teleconferencing products get better and better, there's ultimately pressure to fly less and instead do these things remotely. And so what you're seeing is this triple pressure on businesses to stop flying so much as we become more conscious about climate change and start pricing in these externalities that we haven't. And as those profits go down, we're at the same time seeing an increase in the cost that we as non-business flyers are seeing in the effect of these carbon credits that we now have to pay for. So we're going to fly less. And that means this economy of scale that was once subsidizing the flights, making them barely break even, allowing them to profit off the additional business higher margin tickets, is now just totally falling apart at both seams. The airlines won't be able to fly or operate anywhere remotely the way they do now with even their razor-thin margins. It's going to have to be a totally different model if these planes and these airlines can exist at all. Unless, of course, you know, we just ignore the environmental damage and we just say, fuck it, let's burn the earth because we want to be able to fly and travel as quickly as possible. So what we're seeing here, Daniel, I think is actually really interesting in that If we start pricing in these externalities, which is something that we're going to have to do ultimately, uh, we can see very quickly the effect that flying doesn't make sense for people if you account for the damage you're doing to the earth. And and we'll talk again about carbon credits. um, And you can buy carbon credits now for your flights, but they are basically scams. They're so dramatically underpriced compared to the actual cost of sequestering that carbon, the entire carbon credit economy that you can, you know, check that box and add on to your ticket price. Or some airlines even say that they are offsetting everything uh, that you fly automatically built into the ticket price. It's basically a scam. The people selling the the, the credits from whatever projects they're doing are scamming them. The carbon credit uh, certification programs are basically scams. The companies that turn around and sell these carbon credits are scams. And ultimately, People who purchase these are lying to themselves if they're if they're not totally, you know, maybe we'll give them the benefit of the doubt in their ignorance. But these are like buying indulgences from the Catholic Church during the period of uh, the Inquisitions where like, oh, you know, I've sinned. Here's some money. Uh, I'm sorry for my sins. You know, you're not absolving yourself of anything here because you're contributing to these larger problems and pretending that it's fine when really you're 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 fucking up the earth. Sorry. I'm, I lost my way again. Well, there's actually a movement, a social movement that took shape in Sweden, spreading to other countries in which people actually shame those who fly on planes. They call it flight shaming. And on the flip side of that is train bragging. So at least people are concerned about the environmental impact of flying on a plane. But David, you know, you mentioned the way that uh, business class people basically subsidize the rest of our tickets because airlines make so much and profit from them that they are then able to lower prices to attract more customers like us for those cheaper seats. And so, you know, like in my opinion, and I think this is something we went back and forth on before recording for the show, I love the idea of people waking up to this environmental problem, even shaming people for, for flying is fine. But I think there's a big difference between a working class person, you know, who clocks in and out every day at an Amazon warehouse, saves up as much money as she can, and then purchases a plane ticket to go visit her parents, or even take a much needed vacation. There's a big difference between that person and someone who owns rental property, makes a bunch of passive income and flies around the world to hike in some exotic place every other month. Or even, you know, there's a lot of companies, like you were mentioning, that just fly their their employees around all the time. I got a business degree, and so I still know some people who work in investment banks and these uh, management consulting firms, and they get flown around like crazy, David. Um, you know, I know a guy who's been to like five different cities in the past uh, couple months, uh, not even for work, but his company will just pay for him to get a ticket anytime he wants, go visit a city, gives him money for food. And so while, yes, we should say, look, me as an individual, I should not fly if I have an alternative choice. I think 
this question of air travel demand and climate change is really less about our individual choices than this broader system of economic injustice. So yes, of course, that management consultant firm is contributing massively to this problem, flying their employees around all over the place, but also more than likely the work they actually do could possibly contribute to this environmental problem, especially if they're helping businesses expand in new markets and the type of things they do. But I want to come back to this individual choice because I think there's something underlying our demand for air travel that is not addressed enough. And that's how economic precarity has altered the way we live our lives, which is how common is it to hear uh, someone changing cities for a job? How common is it to hear that work has pulled someone away from their hometown and, and they now work across the country or in a new country for the headquarters of the company that they work for? And this is something we take for granted in our modern society that, yeah, your job just comes first, right? If your job takes you somewhere, that's where you go. But that reality is created from the fact that we are all in a state of economic precarity where we don't have the security to exist in the communities that we want, right? We can't just grow up in our hometowns, live in the communities we were given, and sustain our lives. Because the economy has forced us into this position where if we do not conform to the corporate models and that lifestyle, if we do not conform to the market's conception of a good worker bee, then we're not going to get fed. We won't have a roof over our head. And so for that reason, culturally, we have uh, compensated for this precarity by placing our value and priorities in work. And that has caused all of us to spread out. David, uh, you live in New York. I live in Atlanta. I have friends who live in cities that they were not born in. They moved away from their family. They were the first among their friends and family to even move to the city. And so is it any wonder that we want to travel? Is it any wonder that we want to go visit our family on Christmas, that we need to get on a plane just to come back to our hometowns? I used to work in the service industry a lot, David. I was a server at a couple different restaurants at a time. And so just in that line of work, I met a lot of people who came from other countries, whether that was China or Indonesia uh, or South America. And they came to this country to find work and make a little bit of cash that they could then send back to their family. And so would I blame them for getting on an international flight to go home to visit the people that they've left? You think they want to be washing dishes in a restaurant in a foreign country so that they can give their daughter or their mother a better quality of life, I could not blame them for that. And so I do agree. I see where this, this flight shaming is coming from. And I totally agree that we, in our privileged uh, positions, we do travel too much. We do get on planes too quickly and without thinking. And we should be more conscious of the carbon footprint. But at the same time, we need to recognize that the underlying economic structures have put us in positions where we depend on that. And unlike the, the TEDx speaker who's saying, you know, we can't continue as business as usual, but oh, by the way, we should just maintain the economy business as usual and just reduce uh, fuel efficiency. No, we should think of ways that we can improve the justice of our economic system such that people are not put in such desperate situations that they have to go halfway around the world just to hope for a better life. Well, Daniel, since you're bringing up shaming here, I certainly don't want to shame the individuals, the regular Joes like you and me who are flying. And yeah, I mean, we shouldn't be doing it if we can. But like you mentioned, uh, it's not productive necessarily to talk about it that way. But there is one group of people that we absolutely can and should be shaming. And those are people who are flying in their own private aircraft, private jets and the like. And, and these are mostly business leaders who don't really have a need to do this outside of a perceived convenience and, and luxury, of course, but they are polluting far outside their per capita amount, even more than the regular person. So uh, a, a lot of these are people who are claiming that they're doing things for environmental reasons. One of my favorite in this category and one of my favorite targets on this show for being a giant hypocrite is Elon Musk somebody who runs a company that is ostensibly about saving the earth, and that's something he talks about all the time. This is the mission that we are working on, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he frequently commutes to work on a G650ER, a very nice, a very expensive Gulfstream jet that burns hundreds of gallons of fuel per hour, is one of the least efficient 
aircraft in the world. That's not a military craft. Uh, and he uses this oftentimes to take flights as short as 20 minutes because he mostly just doesn't want to drive in L.A. traffic. Uh, he ends up saving it when you consider the extra time driving to the airport to take off the landing, whatever, blah, blah, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes in a day. Something that he could be doing work during this time anyway, if he had a driver and is actively making the world a far worse place. In fact, he he's flown quite frequently. There's a great visualization somebody did uh, recently showing just how much Elon Musk in particular has flown for business. But but almost every single flight he's taken, he could have done either using alternative forms of transport that are much more efficient, uh, like his EV cars, or taking traditional uh, large body aircraft uh, with you and me and other plebeians who he maybe doesn't want to rub shoulders with because uh, he's absolutely an elitist. And we see that in so many of the projects that he suggests as solutions for public transportation. But, but him, uh, other business leaders, uh, people who are flying these private jets all around the world, uh, and, and take pride in the fact that they burn all this fuel, that they have this convenience, and blah, blah, blah. Every single one of these crafts should be grounded right now, today, immediately. If we were serious about climate change, we would do this action because there's no reason for people to do this. They're taking something that we already have available, that is easy, simple air travel from one place to the other, duplicating it in a far less efficient, far more polluting way for their own convenience and luxury. And there's no reason that this should exist. And of course, yes, you know, uh, the this would damage all these small airports that depend upon the hangar fees and flight fees for, for these aircraft to utilize them. But of course, this once again just illustrates how unsustainable the entire airline industry is, dependent upon the offset externalities of damaging the earth in order to stay profitable in the first place. Just like every other industry, you know, this is something that's not profitable when you take into account all these ignored externalities. But we should absolutely be shaming everyone who flies private. There's absolutely no excuse for that. And I say that as somebody who, you know, part of me wants a private pilot's license. And, and maybe one day, you know, I could do that on electric craft because, come on, it's pretty cool to fly. But people flying for business on these private jets that are so incredibly inefficient, we should be shaming them. Uh, we should be blocking them. We should be, you know, damaging, sabotaging these crafts. Uh, that is absolutely something that should be happening if we're choosing someone to shame. But I digress. I want to circle back real quick to that Jevons paradox that you came up with, or I guess Mr. Jevon. Actually, Jevon came up with. So I was thinking about that concept uh, after listening to that clip that I played earlier, which is that I think there's this insidious nature to those types of narratives, especially when they're coming from corporations, which is that so many of the proponents of technology and efficiency and even renewables, right? are presented by what are essentially con men who are selling us the false promise of saving the world in exchange for public money for technology that benefits their business models. Meanwhile, they continue to destroy the world. This is something we touched on in our episode on recycling, episode 66, Trash Talk, that the public is sold this narrative that businesses don't want to invest in clean technology. They don't want to invest in efficient technology, but we, the public, we force them to go green and that saves the world. When in reality, these businesses, they have to invest in efficiency just to stay afloat because as resources become more scarce, you have to squeeze more and more out of what's remaining just to stay competitive. That's what the recycling industry largely exists to do. They provide manufacturers with cheaper inputs so that they can continue to grow production. That production, which is the very thing that is driving global climate change and environmental destruction. So in the sense, the recycling industry in its current form actually accelerates environmental degradation. And the same thing is going on here with this emphasis placed on fuel efficiency and better technology for airplanes. Notice that, that he did not say we need to curb demand for air travel. Uh, he did not say we need to restructure our economies or scale back airlines. He did not say we need to take airplanes out of commission so that we're not burning as much fuel. No, he said we should invest in more fuel efficient plane engines, which by the way, airlines must do if they wish to remain profitable in a future of rising fuel prices. They have to do that regardless of whether it's coming from a place of wanting to be green. So if we, the public, think that we can just give them public money, 
for our benefit, we've got the whole thing backwards. We're basically giving them free money so that they can compete with other businesses, make more profit, and leave us with a world that's uninhabitable. All right, David, uh, I think I'm going to take this plane and land it on the runway. Where else were you planning on landing it, Daniel? Sometimes I think I can just keep on flying, David, and never touch ground. I'm going to just ignore everything you say, just like I've been doing for the past 20 minutes. Uh, Anyway, David, with my uh, ramblings and your ramblings aside, what is the future of air travel? How how immediate future are we talking? And are we talking realistic or uh, pie in the sky? Because I, I think I opened up with what I want to see as the future of air travel, but... And maybe we will do, I think we should do a future travel thing at some point. And, and I want to get to what that might mean just briefly, actually, in a moment here. Yeah, maybe we can have Mr. Jevin on the podcast. He's, he's long dead. Damn. Very long dead. Um, but there is efficiency work being done. That 30% figure that you were talking about, Daniel, what if I told you that people are working on 100% reduction in fuel use right now? Uh. I don't want to get my hopes up after you... Good, you shouldn't. Be- they are working on it. Um, there are a number of companies starting up uh, working on making electric aircraft. Uh, it is a difficult problem, and the battery technology just really isn't there right now. Um, Solid-state batteries should start coming out in the next year or two. Toyota just announced a big breakthrough with that, and as, as well as several other major battery manufacturers for their electrical vehicles. But until these solid state batteries and more uh, energy dense products eventually come down the line, we're going to be very limited in terms of what is feasible with these electric aircraft because batteries are heavy. And unlike fuel, as you burn it, the craft gets lighter, increasing your efficiency. But once you've loaded a plane with batteries, it's always going to weigh that much. And batteries are much less energy dense than jet fuel. The types of engines that we use with these are much less uh, efficient than jets. So we're finding a lot of natural things right here to even get back up to the place that with these wide body ultra efficient aircraft that we have now can do in terms of converting energy into miles traveled. But there are several companies working on it with major uh, investors backing them in both airlines and aircraft companies. Uh, There's also work being put into hydrogen fuel based airplanes, Uh, but the future ultimately hopefully will be electric, but not only electric, But the ways that we are designing these aircraft are very different because wide-bodied electric aircraft are very far off. These are like your 737s, 787s, these large airplanes that we're used to. But what will come out first are small craft that are maybe 10, 20, 30 people doing very short point-to-point hops. Um, This is probably the immediate future of the airline industry 10 years from now, where you'll buy tickets that won't be affected by oil prices, won't be affected by carbon credits so much. Remember, just because something doesn't burn fuel doesn't mean that it required fuel to be produced and that fuel must eventually be offset. But that aside, these aircraft will be small electric sort of business jet looking things that make small jumps 500 to 700 miles point to point. And if you are going longer than that point to point, then you're going to be getting to this new system, which I don't think it even has a name yet. It's not central hub based. It's not point to point, but it's it's sort of the traveling salesman. Okay, I'm going to fly from Atlanta to uh, Chicago, then Chicago to Houston, and then Houston to LAX, something like that. So we're going to be doing lots of jumps. Air flights are going to be much more tedious than they were before, and the aircraft themselves are going to be slower, but they will be smaller, so maybe they'll be more luxurious that way. And as this technology improves, they're planning on increasing the size of these aircraft so we can look forward eventually to electric aircraft. But that is a ways off right now. The proof of concepts aren't even flying at the moment. This is still very much a design on a piece of paper in a computer. In the, the shorter term future, maybe five years out, there are several companies who are making um, basically what are vertical takeoff and landing craft. Uh, these are the flying cars almost that people have been talking about for decades at this point. It's just around the corner. Uh, these basically are scaled up drones or Osprey-like aircraft. Many of them are electric. Some of them are hybrid electric. Some of them are full conventional fuel. And uh, the idea is that they're going to basically operate as air taxis. So they'll be safer than a helicopter, uh, cheaper to operate, but function basically the same. You'll come to these basically heliport areas in a city. 
hop onto a plane. It'll fly you very short distances. Uh, one of the routes that it talks about, for example, one of these startups is from New York to Boston. You'll pay more than a ticket to New York to Boston cost at a conventional airline, say 200, 250 bucks, but you will have no wait. It'll take you from the city center to the city center. You won't have an airport. Traveling to the airport, there won't be any lines or anything because this is outside the the regular jurisdiction that we see in these large airports and the infrastructure that's required to support them. Uh, So some people might find it very uh, advantageous. And we might go back, actually, Daniel, to that regulation sort of period of flying where we have smaller, more luxurious flights that you pay a lot more for, but you do so because of either the extreme convenience they offer or because you're just wealthy. Uh, that might be the future. Of course, this could all change depending on various oil shocks. We might see that nobody's flying conventional jets just because they become too expensive. If that shale oil starts getting tight and we don't get that much more, oil barrel prices will go up, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to get into a peak oil thing here. But fact of the matter is the airline industry as we see it right now is not going to exist 20, 30 years from now, in my opinion. Not if we want to make any sort of sizable impact on preventing climate change. If we just throw our hands up and say, well, you know what, fuck it, there's nothing we can do, then yeah, okay, we might be business as usual. We might still be able to to have these cheap flights. But fact of the matter is, we lived in a very brief anomaly in time where we were able to travel around the world very rapidly for very little money. And while there are a couple companies trying to get back to even more rapid travel, there's notably a company called Boom that is making a new supersonic passenger jet. Um, for a small number of people, I think it's 30 to 50, that will fly international routes the same way the Concorde did, which was a huge, giant waste of money, even if it was really cool. It just couldn't find a good place in terms of its business propositions and the, the accidents sort of marred the brand. But for most of us, what the future holds is either no travel in terms of airlines or slow travel. And I want to dwell on this just for a moment, Daniel, here, the idea that Maybe we don't need to rush everywhere. And the idea that we have to rush everywhere right now because of these economic forces that are pushed down on us. I mean, here in the United States, what? If you get a job, you're lucky to have 20 days of vacation. Like, very lucky. The rest of the world laughs at that. You know, if in Germany, a place offered you 20 days of vacation, that's criminal. People would laugh and turn away. But here in the freest country on earth, uh, we spend our entire year basically working. We have no time to ourselves. And so that means when we do have time, when we do organize one of these trips, when we saved up our vacation days, accrued them through our years of hard work, then we have to optimize it, maximize it, travel as fast as we can to get there, uh, make sure our days are planned out, that we can do everything we need to, and then rush back and so we can get back to work the next day. Yeah, that's true. You know, So I'm the type of person that like, when I travel, I love to not have any plans. I don't like to have an itinerary. I kind of like to just show up in an area, talk to someone who's from the area. And I've talked to many Americans about how rewarding that type of travel is. But so often I get the response of, yeah, well, that would be nice. But when, <laughs> when I get one week a year, I don't really have the luxury of taking that type of risk because it can be risky, right? You don't always have the best experience. You simply open yourself up to uh, serendipity and, and the possibility of a unique experience you could never plan for. But you're absolutely right. When, you, when you're on a time budget, maybe you don't feel like that's worth the risk. Yeah. Well, I mean, I had a very similar experience growing up. When I traveled with my parents and we, we rarely flew, we would drive somewhere, but it was always like a breakneck cannonball run where my dad would drive like 11 or 13 hours to wherever it is we're going. We're like cranky and miserable the whole time. We left at like four in the morning to avoid traffic. It's just like a straight drive. We stop every now and then for, for bathroom breaks, but we don't, there's, no, there's no sightseeing on the way because we have to get to our destination. And when we get there, every day is itinerary out. Okay, we're waking up at, at seven, we're waking up at eight so we can get to the museum or whatever, we, blah, blah, blah. The entire thing was like bulleted down. And that's how I just thought everyone vacationed for a long time uh-huh. until I got older and I went on a vacation by myself or with uh, friends. They're like, what are you doing? Why, why are you planning all this stuff? Why are you rushing around? And I was like, wait, you know what? You're right. What am I doing? And I had to relearn how to have a vacation um, for my non-American friends and teaching me, oh, this is the way that, that most people see this, this like much slower pace of life. Vacations are supposed to be relaxing, not just filled with things. Yeah, it is a very American conception of travel. I actually knew somebody who uh, organized a group trip with their friends to go sightsee in Europe. 
after graduating from the university, they had a whole month or two and they still planned it out. So they'd get, they'd hit a new city every single like few days. <laughs> so it was like hit Paris, spend two days and then immediately go to a new city. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's not a surprising that this happens because as Americans, you know, we're poor, we're time poor and we're physically poor. Uh, even though we have all this wealth, supposedly whatever, it's tied up in this you know, our rent, our, our obligations, our debts that we carry around with us. And so we don't have this free time or money to spend on these things that we would. So we have to maximize them in order to get our most value out from what we see as, as the way that, that this is how travel is supposed to be done. And airlines and this rapid form of travel, I think, really contributes to that. And the idea of slow travel, of enjoying the journey as you did in, when you mentioned your stories about wandering around Europe, or these, these Swedish people who enjoy the train ride, which is still rapid, to be fair. It's much more so in Europe than it is here in the U.S., where train delays are frequent on Amtrak or whatever. But the focus then is, is not just on trying to get there as fast as possible, but enjoying this part of the journey itself. And that becomes part of the larger trip. When I fly somewhere, I don't think of that as part of my vacation. I think of that as a tedious chore that has to be done to get where it goes. But if I'm on a road trip... Even Americans will say, yeah, road trip. That's, that's the journey itself. That's the fun part. Mm-hmm. And yet you stop places and you see things, but the actual just sitting in the car and driving can be part of that enjoyable things. And as we move forward into a more and more energy conscious future where we realize we don't have endless stores of energy that can just be burned without consequences, endangering all the life on this earth, I think we really need to come to terms with the way that we travel, the way that we see this instant gratification around every component of our world needs to change as well. We need to focus on this slower world where the journey itself, because it's going to be a large portion of our vacation, has to be part of the enjoyable component. So that's why these Zeppelins, which maybe can only travel 70 or 80 miles per hour uh, nonstop, of course, weather permitting, and that is the big problem with Zeppelins, I will admit, uh, but that allows us to enjoy the process. Maybe for our international travel in the future, we won't be flying, but instead taking ships Mm -hmm. where maybe it's a week or two or three to get across the ocean. Maybe these ships even have sails, so it takes longer than that. I mean, people do that now for cruises and they pay for that privilege. Yeah, that's a good point. Even if cruise ships themselves are extremely polluting and problematic. And we (laughs) talked a little bit about that with the labor problems that happen on them. Right. Um, And and I don't want to encourage everyone to take cruises because that is absolutely not the right message to take from this. (laughs) But yeah, we talked about that in uh, logistics of slavery, I believe. Yeah, exactly. But slow travel, I mean, this really is something that we need to come to terms with where the journey is the enjoyable part. And we get to destinations and we enjoy that, but the actual process of getting there is just as, if not more important. And that's the kind of cultural shift we're going to have to see if we want to tackle this larger climate change problem that's associated with air travel. And this also carries over to businesses as well. We can't just say, even though we have this heavily globalized international world where I need to be able to travel over to have meetings and whatever, maybe it shouldn't be like that. Maybe if we discourage how easy it is to fly somewhere, to have this meeting, to exploit international labor, or to exploit different labor even within your own domestic country, then we can encourage these local industries to form up and and be more self-sufficient, more decentralized in the same process, and ultimately more sustainable because of that. Because we're not depending on the exploitation of resources and labor from other places where we can strip mine them until they're dry and empty and, and just husks of what they were before but instead focus on building actual communities all around the world that focus on the local needs. And if we're just focusing on local needs, we don't have access necessarily to everything we might want, but that might be just what we need in order not to consume more than we should. Mm -hmm. And I really think this grander way of thinking that air travel has enabled us, the idea that the world is at our fingertips, has been part of the huge problem in our exploitation of that world. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the explosion in resource use, in pollution, in carbon dioxide emissions correlates very closely with the explosion in air travel. Yeah. So if there's one thing I I really want everyone to take away from this is slow down. I think that's a really beautiful way to put it, like putting the imagination back in travel, especially because I think it is a little bit problematic when we walk around on this earth pointing fingers at people And I know I have to clarify this because, again, that's kind of what we do on this show, and I'm all for that, you know, name and shame. But for our own mental health, 
it wouldn't hurt every now and then to instead take a step back and imagine what a better world might be and then encourage people to think along the same lines as opposed to and I'm speaking to myself here instead of just telling people hey you know you take that flight you're destroying the world maybe you shouldn't do that instead I absolutely agree we should focus on well imagine what travel could be like if we work together to create an environment where we all enjoy that slow travel and are okay with not having the same access to the cheap flights that we're used to. Exactly. And there's one image I think I want to leave everyone with because you might try and communicate some of these ideas to your friends, to your family who aren't necessarily as, as aware of, of this stuff. And when we start talking about radiative forcing and tons of carbon dioxide, people's eyes glaze over and, and nobody wants to hear or see that or whatever. So I, I want to give you a very visual representation of what exact damage you're doing when you take one of these flights or when you decide to drive a long distance. So there was a paper that came out recently that tried to quantify exactly this. How much sea ice in the Arctic is melted for every X number of carbon emitted? So we as Americans emit on average 16 tons of carbon every single year. Uh, If you're flying domestically, you're probably going to emit between half a ton and a ton of carbon, um, calculating in that radiative forcing if you're flying economy uh, for the round trip. And, and so one ton, if you want to figure out how much sea ice you are melting off into oblivion with one ton, it's a little bit over, and I'm going to give this in yards first. Oh, 0.7 polar bear homes. <laughs> well, polar bears, I think, is an important part of this image, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, but The actual number is basically, and again, this is in in, in yards, and I'll I'll give you the meters in a second, but I think this is more useful for the Americans uh, who need to... We need to hear it more. Yeah. So basically, three yards by three yards, a square. So almost 10 feet by 10 feet is burned for every round-trip domestic flight that you, you take, probably, more or less. The actual number is one ton of carbon emissions burns three by three yards. Well, three by three meters, but it's close enough. Yeah, that's that puts it into perspective. Yeah, if, if we're emitting uh, on average 16 tons per capita, that is 16 times three by three. So that's four, four by four. So four times three, it's 12. That's 12 meters by 12 meters. or about the size of a large apartment, right? 1,200 square feet, roughly. I think my math is right. 1,200 square feet uh, would cost you $2,400 a month in some of the high-end rental uh, units in Atlanta, David. Well, I hope my math is right. And if somebody wants to double check me in there, please do, because I'm just doing this in my head as I sit here. But uh, yeah, that, that's a very visual way to think about the damage you're doing to the earth every single year, living the life that we do as Americans. And to pull back that polar bear image, Daniel, if anybody's seen planet Earth, you've seen these starving polar bears who are swimming in this vast seas, trying to find a patch of ice to sit on. And well, if you hadn't done all that stuff, there'd be a very large apartment-sized block of ice waiting for that polar bear to climb up on and rest and, and seals to sit on for them to eat. But it's not. It's water now. Have you considered, though, David, that polar bears are one of the few species on this planet that will actively hunt human beings? Well, maybe it's a problem that'll solve itself then. If the polar bears eat enough of us, then we'll be fine. (laughs) There you go. From planes to Jevon to polar bears. It's a lot to think about, Daniel. But think about it and do something about it. We hope you will. You can find more information about all the topics we've talked about today those interesting science papers, as well as a full transcript of this show on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it and would like us to keep going, you, our listener, uh, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, and visiting us at patreon.com slash ashesashescast. This week, we'd like to thank our associate producers, John Fitzgerald and Chad Peterson. Thank you for supporting us. And if you would like to learn more about what it is to be an associate producer, you can go to that Patreon page and find it there. Also, we do have an email address. It's contact at ashesashes.org. Send us your thoughts. We appreciate that. We also have a phone number, which David's going to read for you uh, very shortly. But I just want to point out 
or I just want to say we have received a handful of voicemails from you, the listener. We appreciate that. We just haven't found a good place to put those in the show yet. So we're still playing around with that. We might actually just do a Q&A, not even a Q&A, but just a show. Yeah, like, like a call-in show where we play listener recordings and we talk about them a little bit and then we play another one. Yeah. So if you want to be part of that show... And if you want to make sure that we are answering your questions or talking about your favorite pet peeve topics, then you should call us and leave a message. That number is 313-99-ASHES. That's 313-992-7437. Just call and uh, start recording once you hear us say go. And uh, we'll be sure to get a recording of that and uh, add it to the show. We're really excited about this technology. We're just trying to figure out the best way to integrate it, like Daniel says. And this seems like a fun way to do it. Yeah. Also, great job reading that phone number. That is very professional sounding. I've been practicing. Well, you're a natural. But if all of that isn't enough for you, we also have a handful of social media accounts at your favorite social networks, all at Ashes Ashes Cast. You can also find our awesome Discord community, and a link to that is on our website. If you click the community section and click the Discord link, you can join us there. We have almost 200 people there, and they are active and awesome, and uh, we've been talking about farming a lot lately, so you should right. check that out. Gardening, it's... homesteading. Yeah. If you have a garden, come on, join us, talk about it, send us pictures. Also, plenty of collapse support talk. It's, it's really a great group of people, so shout out to all of you on the Discord. We love you. We've also been adding some new emojis, so <laughs> you can express yourself in uh, a variety of ways. Yeah, the fun never ends, <laughs> except now. This is the end of the episode. We hope you'll tune in next week. We've got another great show coming, uh, but until then, this is Ashes Ashes. The fun of a collapsing world goes down, but the party here at Ashes Ashes only goes up. Never ends. Bye. Bye-bye.